Principles. Principles to an osteopath means a perfect plan and specification to build and form a house, an engine, a man, a world, or anything for an object or purpose. To comprehend this engine of life or man which is so constructed with all conveniences for which it was made, it is necessary to constantly keep the plan and specification before the mind and in the mind to such a degree that there is no lack of knowledge of the bearings and uses of all parts. After a complete knowledge of all parts, with their forms, sizes, and places of attachment, which should be so thoroughly grounded in the memory that there would be no doubt of the intent of the builder for the use or purpose of the great and small parts, and why they have a part to perform in the workings of the engine. When this part of the specification is thoroughly learned from anatomy or the engineer's guidebook, he will then take up the chapter on the division of forces by which this engine moves and performs the duties for which it was created. In this chapter, the mind will be referred to the brain to obtain a knowledge of that organ where the forces starts, how it is conducted to any belt, pulley, journal, or division of the whole building. After learning where the force is obtained and how conveyed from place to place throughout the whole body, he becomes interested and wisely instructed. He sees the various parts of this great system of life when preparing fluids commonly known as blood, passing through a set of tubes both great and small, some so vastly small as to require the aid of powerful microscopes to see their infinitely small forms through which the blood and other fluids are conducted by the heart and force of the brain to construct organs, muscles, membranes, and all of the things necessary to life and motion to the parts separately and combined. By this minute acquaintance with the normal body which has been learned in the specification as written in standard authors of anatomy in the dissecting rooms, he is well prepared to be invited into the inspection room to receive comparisons between normal and abnormal engines built according to nature's plan and specification and absolutely perfect. He is called into this room for the purpose of comparing engines that have been strained from being thrown off the track or run against other bodies with such force as to bend journals, pipes, break or loosen belts, or otherwise deranged, so as to render it useless until repaired. To repair signifies to readjust from the abnormal condition in which the machinist finds it to the condition of the normal engine which stands in the shop of repairs. His inspection would commence by first lining up the wheels with straight journals, then he would naturally be conducted to the boiler, steam chest, shafts, and every part that belongs to a complete engine. To know that they are straight and in place, as shown upon the plan and described by the specification, he has done all that is required of a master mechanic. Then it goes into the hands of the engineer, who waters, fires, and conducts this artificial being on its journey. You, as osteopathic machinists, can go no further than to adjust the normal condition in which you find the afflicted. afflicted. Nature will do the rest. The Practicing Osteopath's Guide The osteopath reasons, if he reasons at all, that order and health are inseparable, and that when order in all parts is found, disease cannot prevail. And if order is complete and disease should be found, there is no use for order. And if order and health are universally one in union, then the doctor cannot usefully, physiologically, or philosophically be guided by any scale of reason otherwise. Does a chemist get results desired by accident? Are your accidents more likely to get good results than his? Does order and success demand thought and cool-headed reason? If we wish to be governed by reason, we must take a position that is founded on truth and capable of presenting facts to prove the validity of all truths we present. A truth is only a hopeful supposition if it is not supported by results. Thus, all nature is kind enough to willingly exhibit specimens of its work as vindicating witnesses of its ability to prove its assertions by its work. Without that tangible proof, nature would belong to the gods of chance. The laws of mother, conception, growth, and birth, from atoms to worlds, would be a failure, a universe without a head to direct. 
But as the beautiful works of nature stand today and in all time past, fully able by evidence it holds before the eye and mind of reason that all beings, great and small, came by the law of cause and effect, are we not bound to work by the laws of cause if we wish an effect? If the heavens do more by cause, when was its beings divorced from that great common law? Are we not bound to trust and work by the old and reliable self-evident laws until something later has proven its superior ability to ward off disease and cure the sick? The Fascia I know of no part of the body that equals the fascia as a hunting ground. I believe that more rich golden thought will appear to the mind's eye as the study of the fascia is pursued than any division of the body. Still, one part is just as great and useful as any other in its place. No part can be dispensed with. But the fascia is the ground in which all causes of death do the destruction of life. Every view we take, a wonder appears. Here we find a place for the white corpuscles building anew and giving strength to throw impurities from the body by tubes that run from the skin to tanks of useful fluids that would heap up and are no longer of use in the body. No doubt nerves exist in the fascia that change the fluid to gas and force it through the spongy and porous system as a delivery by the vital chain of wonders that go on all the time to keep nerves wholly pure. Not a pleasant task. I dislike to write and only do so when I think my productions will go into the hands of kind-hearted geniuses who read not to find a book of quotations, but to go with the soul of the subject that is being explored for its merits, weigh all truths, and help bring its uses front for the good of man. Osteopathy has not asked a place in written literature prior to this date, and does not hope to appear on written pages even to suit the author of this imperfectly written book without accepted theories. Columbus had to launch and navigate much and long and meet many storms because he had not written the experience of other travelers to guide him. He had only a few bits of driftwood not common to his home growth to cause him to move as he did. But there was a fact, a bit of wood that did not grow on his home soil. He reasoned, that it must be from some land amid the sea whose shores had not before been known to his race. With these facts in his powerful mind of reason he met all opposition and moved alone, just as all men do who have no use for theories as their compass to guide them through the storms. This opposition a mental explorer must meet. I felt that I must anchor my boat to living truths and follow them wheresoever they might drift. Thus I launched my boat many years ago on the open seas, fearlessly, and have never found a wave of scorn nor abuse that truth could not eat and do well on. Truths of Nature We often speak of truth. We say great truths and use many other qualifying expressions, but no one truth is greater than any other truth. Each has a sphere of usefulness peculiar to itself. Thus we should treat with great respect and reverence all truths, great and small. A truth is the complete work of nature, which can only be demonstrated by the vital principle belonging to the class of truths. Each truth, or division as we see it, can only be made known to us by the self-evident fact which this truth is able to, be, to demonstrate by its action. If we take man as our object to base the beginning of our reason, we find the association of many elephant elements which differ in kind to suit the purpose for which they were designed. To us they act, to us they are wisely formed and located for the purpose for which they were designed. Through our five senses we deal with the material body. It has action, that we observe by vision which connects the mind to reason. High above the five senses, on the subject of cause or causes of this, is motion. By the testimony of the witness, the mind is connected in a manner by which it can reason on solidity and size. By smell, taste, and sound, we make other connections between the chambers of reason and the object we desire to reason upon, and thus our foundation on which all five witnesses are arrayed to the superior principle which is the mind. After seeing a human being complete in form, self-moving, with power to stop or go on will, to us he seems to obey some commander. He seems to go so far and stop. 
He lies down and gets up. He turns round and faces the objects that are traveling in the same direction he does. Possibly he faces the object by his own action. Then, by about facing, he sees one coming with greater velocity, sees he cannot escape by his own speed, so he steps aside and lets that body pass on as though he moved in obedience to some order. The bystander would ask the question, how did he know such a dangerous body was approaching? He finds on the most crucial examination that the sense of hearing is wholly without reason. The same is true with all the five senses pertaining to man, beast, or bird. This being the condition of the five physical senses, we are forced by reason to conclude that there is a superior being who conducts the material man, sustains, supports, and guards against danger, and after all our explorations, we have to decide that man is triune when complete. Body, Motion, and Mind First, the material body, second, the sp spiritual being, Third, a being of mind which is far superior to all vital motions and material forms whose duty is to wisely manage this great engine of life. This great principle known as mind must depend for all evidences on the five senses, and on this testimony all mental conclusions are bad and all orders from this mental court are issued to move any point or to stop at any place. Thus, to obtain good results, we must blend ourselves with and travel in harmony with nature's truths.